Okay, so um, hello, my name is Catherine Field and I'm a professor in AFNS and um, I'm also a tier one chair in um, human nutrition and metabolism. And we have actually our dean here. Where did he go? There he is. He's back at the annoying man's table. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is really wonderful. And um, we've only, um, we're missing one committee member. There was another committee member, um, Habid Rahman. And Habib had to go back to India for some family issues. So he was here until this week. So we're kind of giving him our, our hellos from Edmonton. Um, so I would like to first acknowledge before we start that we're um, on the University of Alberta and we're located on Treaty 6 territory, which is uh, definitely that of the first people where the pinnacle continuation of First Nations, Métis, and others have been. And we were, we're really pleased that we can also perform on this um, property. So um, this is the Ronald O. Ball and Ruth Ball. Um, and they are in attendance somewhere. I just saw them a minute ago. There they are at the front. Yes. So thank you very, very much for funding this uh, symposia. Um, we'd like to welcome them um, to be recognized and maybe stand. So um, this this lecture um, has been built around um, some of Ron's, before Ron retired early, we were graduate students together. Uh, so before he retired early, um, he decided he would put together this uh, symposia or this idea to bring someone who could say something that's sort of a little controversial um, about uh, the landscape. So we've known each other since university, and uh, he's really done a number of impressive things, so I can't retire for a while because I'm not going to actually get there. <laughs> so both when he was at U of T in Guelph and then when he came here, he did a lot of work on developing the limiting amino acid um, uh, process and what that was used was with him and Paul Penchars, who's at Sick Kids, that they tested this out in infants and it was really successful and now the WHO is using this as the method to, to uh, determine the requirements of other groups in our society. So um, Ron's been awarded a number of times for this work. The first time was with the American Society for Nutrition, um, and he was given the, uh, what was it called, the Osborne Mendel Award with him and Paul Penchars for developing this, which like is amazing. And then in 2008, he was given the, um, uh, the award from the Canadian Nutrition Society, the Willard uh, McHenry Award. So he's been well recognized in both countries for his work. There's been a lot of others, but those are the two of the two societies that I know the best. So um, I like to talk about them. Um, <laughs> so Ron decided when he re when he would, he was going to retire that he would dedicate this um, symposia to some topics that were really interesting to people at the university that crossed many disciplines. Um, this year it's nutrition um, and related uh, activities and that this would become from 2003 the Ron Ball lecture. So thank you very much Ron. So just a little housekeeping before I start, and that will be with, um, the, the talk is going to be somewhere 35-ish minutes, 
And then after that, we're going to have time for questions, and then there'll be more food, and that kind of stuff will happen. So, <laughs> so what I'd like to say is that um, please keep your questions till the end. We are recording, recording this, so we will be putting it on, um, on I guess, I, don't, I wanted to say TikTok, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be putting this on the university website, and if you want anyone who didn't come to hear what was said today, then please uh, give them the link. Okay, so that's probably enough about background stuff. And so now let's talk about our presenter today. So our presenter is um, Amanda Thompson, and Dr. Thompson's a professor in the, and chair of the Department of Anthropology and a professor in the Department of Nutrition at the Gillings School of um, Global Public Health um, in North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So we're really excited because we haven't had very many visitors here in the last few years. So this is going to be like a first in a long time to have a real person here. So we're very excited. Um, Amanda received her undergrad degree from Harvard University and her MB MPH and um, PhD from Emory, from Emory University, or sorry, her undergrad was from Harvard, those from Emory, and she held a postdoctoral position in the Gillings School of uh, Global Public Health and um, the Carolina Population Center. So she's been, I guess now, a few years at um, uh, University of uh, Chapel Hill. She's trained in biology and a number of ep and, uh, nutritional epidemiology and she focuses on biological pathways linking uh, early, early life, um, environmental issues and international and physical environments. She's also um, been really important in various countries' work, and she's done a lot of work around the world, including work from both North Carolina, but also from the Gallipolis, from uh, China, from Zambia, and from um, Ecuador. So she's traveled, traveled the world. Um, her work has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, and she's a recipient of the 2014 Human Biology Association Award in Nutrition and Development, and she's also got a Nutrition and Development Award from the Society for Nutrition. Um, we've had a wonderful time with Dr. Thompson, um, including today when she went and she gave a lecture to about a hundred of our undergrad students. So that was just amazing. Um, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you, Dr. Thompson, to the podium. So thank you so much for that introdu introduction. Um, thanks to Ron and Ruth for funding this opportunity to come to Edmonton. This is my first time in Edmonton, second time in Alberta. Um, I know there might be a rivalry between Calgary and Edmonton, and I'm going to say I've been enjoying my Edmonton visit much more. Uh, <laughs> and it's just been really wonderful to meet so many of you and so many students, and just really um, a fantastic time here, so thank you. Um, when Catherine invited me, I was thinking, I'm not entirely sure what I do that's controversial. Um, and if this is on TikTok, this will also be my first time on TikTok. So this will be two, um, two things for me. Um, but I do think there are issues around water and thinking about water as being important. So I welcome any and all um, controversial questions at the end. Um, so let me start by trying to convince you why water matters. Um, water is an essential nutrient. It's fundamental for maintaining homeostasis in our body. Um, so we know physiologically we need it, um, but its value extends beyond the physiological needs. Um, reliable access to water in sufficient quantities and high enough quality for a healthy life, what we call water security, is critical for agricultural food production and preparation, um, personal hygiene, and psychological well-being. Um, in other words, water security is one of the things that makes it really possible to have good nutrition and good health. 
And we know that water shapes human health across a number of conditions, um, ranging from undernutrition because of exposure to pathogens in contaminated water sources or due to the limitations of being able to grow food without enough water, um, to cardiometabolic diseases because of uh, metal contaminations in water, for example, and to poorer mental health due to anger and frustration and distress over not having adequate, reliable water sources. Um, and this idea that water insecurity is a problem is not a new one. This is a long-standing problem. And increasingly, misuse and poor management and overextraction of groundwater, um, contamination accompanying climate change and more extreme weather events are all increasing the vulnerability of our water supply globally. And we know that this is something that's a problem now. It's been a problem in the past and is likely to be an even larger problem as we see more um, extreme water or weather events like flooding or droughts, rising sea levels. Um, and those will put strains on systems that are already um, pretty, pretty stretched. Um, and so we have you know, concerns in the future about our water supply um, sanitation infrastructure. Um, and so water is so critical to human health and development that clean water and sanitation were elevated to sustainable development goals when the sustainable development goals were released. Um, and the goal number six there is ensuring equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all by 2020. And then other goals included improving the quality of water as well as improving our efficiency in using water. However, we're not going to make it there. So as of 2020, um, one in four people globally still did not have access to safe drinking water. And you can see from this map that many of those people are concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So if we look at this map, we do see a lot of dark blue. So we do know that three out of four people do have access to safe water. But one of, this, one of the things that this map doesn't show is it doesn't show that there are still millions of people, even in middle and high income countries, that lack access to safe drinking water. So you can see if we look here, the colors for places like the US and Mexico and Canada don't look as good as they did on the last map. And if we look even more closely, um, at the U.S., for example, we know that access to clean water is not evenly distributed in the population. Um, we know that in this top graph that rural low-income communities are the ones who are more likely to have contaminated water sources. Um, if we look here at water systems that have had reports of coliforms in the water, that those tend to be concentrated in rural, low-income, and indigenous neighborhoods. And moreover, there's also in the US a racial and ethnic disparity in, in access to clean water. And it tends to be poorer black and indigenous populations who are more likely to suffer from contamination. And this was dramatically shown in the case of Flint, Michigan, where city residents who are mostly black and low income were exposed to high levels of lead in their drinking water due to an aging system, a lack of governmental will, and a lack of treatment of the water. Um, not to just pick on the US, I'm going to pick on Canada for just one moment, um, and probably because as an outsider this was shocking to me. Um, many of you know this much better than I do, but there are also extreme inequities in water quality and access in Canada, where First Nation communities are less likely to have drinkable um, household water. And so approximately one in eight First Nation communities is under a boil water advisory at any one time. Some of those communities have been under those advisories for three, 10, 30 years. Um, these boil water advisories are two and a half times more frequent for First Nation communities than for non-First Nation communities. And then if we're thinking about human health, the number of waterborne infections in First, Native, First Nations communities are 26 times higher than the Canadian national average. So really marked um, inequities in water quality and access. And what I think this highlights, or maybe this is the controversial part, is that we have these paradoxes, that water is critical for human health, but it's been largely ignored in the nutrition literature as something that's important for health. Um, we also have the paradox that water and access to clean water is seen as a human right and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but that many people and communities lack access to safe and affordable water. 
So given that, it's really important to understand the factors that are associated with water security and then the pathways that link water to human health. So just as a little bit of background, um, water security, as we're thinking about it, is a multidimensional concept. It involves availability, so the physical presence of water, accessibility, so whether water can be acquired through socially acceptable means, and then use, so whether there's enough safe and acceptable water for all water um, needs, so household needs, farming needs, drinking needs, and then what the stability in this looks like across time. So just to provide a little bit more context about each of these, the probably easiest one to think about is water availability. So we know that availability is shaped by things like geography and rainfall. It's also shaped by human use and how much extraction of groundwater is occurring. Um, and we see, and you can certainly see in this map from Canada, that increasing demands due to population growth, particularly urban population growth, um, really do put a strain on groundwater systems. So the colors that you see here in yellow and orange and red are places that are at risk of water scarcity in the future, at least more so than the green areas. Um, and we expect to see this as a condition more globally as well, with changing water, weather patterns, increasing populations, and then increasing needs for water for agriculture and industry. Um, water access is probably a more complex situation than availability because even when water is available, that doesn't mean it's accessible. And um, right now there's an ongoing drought in India, which is where this picture is from. And you can see that the water access here, being able to access water, requires um, using buckets and ropes down a well that in this case is, what is it, it's about eight meters underground. Um, and you know, it's hard to access, and if you have equipment failure, there's not a bucket or not a rope or not a ladder, then people may not be able to access this water. Even in less extreme circumstances, water access might be limited by distance and whether someone's able, due to their age, their reproductive status, their fitness, to even be able to walk to where that water source is. Alongside physical access, we have economic access that might be limited. So poverty or inflated prices of water are a significant burden for people in some communities. Um, and recently a study um, came out showing that in Baltimore, Maryland, so again, a city that has a large proportion of low-income African-American residents, um, water service costs rose by 127% from 2010 to 2018. And this was trying to use kind of individual's water use as a way to pay for infrastructure maintenance by the city rather than you know, taxpayer dollars or other money being used to do the infrastructure upgrades. Um, and then I'm an anthropologist, so I do have to throw in some sociocultural um, and sociopolitical factors that limit access as well. Um, and so in many places, there are cultural proscriptions against who can access water, or there are concerns, for example, about single women going to retrieve water by themselves who they might be at risk of violence or um, you know, interpersonal violence or assault. Um, and finally, the, the map on the bottom here is very close to home for me. It's about 10 miles from my house. Um, and there's a Apex. It's one of the wealthiest communities in North Carolina. It's where a lot of tech people live, a lot of um, just wealthy people in the region will live. And there's a neighborhood called Iron Gate, which is this red or orange um, box here, which is a historically black neighborhood. Um, and all of these uh, paths and little dots represent municipal water, which have not been extended um, into Iron Gate, despite the fact that it abuts these much wealthier neighborhoods. So um, water access might be limited by discrimination as well. So um, another factor that I mentioned was acceptability, and acceptability is based on numerous factors, and these can be objective. So it could be that, you know, if you look at this picture of a river, I don't think this is going to be anyone's first choice for their drinking water if they have a choice. Um, or there could be subjective ideas about water not being clean or not being tasty. Um, but we also know that one of the major factors shaping accessibility globally is water quality. 
And like availability, um, water quality is increasingly being threatened by changes in water temperature, which may be due to, or I'm sorry, changes in water temperature, which might increase things like bacterial contamination or the viruses that can persist in water. Um, it's also affected by changes in land use. So what we're seeing in this picture is an algal bloom as a result of fertilizers running off, um, off land or off is particularly eroded land into the fresh water. Um, that can be harmful as well as waste from mining and other industrial operations, which can cause um, contaminated water. So in case that wasn't you know, cheerful enough, let me also say that there is an issue with stability. So even in places where water quality is good, um, we can have disruptions in availability and access across the year due to seasonal conditions. Um, we know that social and environmental and political instability can affect water and people's access to water in ways that might be unpredictable. Um, as well as seasonal rainfall. So it's hard to predict how much rain we're gonna get in any given season and how that might impact um, crops, for example. Um, or what you're looking at here, which is a beautiful picture of a really disgusting event, which was a hurricane that um, hit the coast of North Carolina, particularly in the area where, where there are swine farms. And so what you're looking at here is flooding that's um, basically contaminated the landscape with, with swine feces and the bacteria that go along with that. Mm -hmm. So given these multiple factors that influence water security, um, it's not surprising that these factors either alone or together can impact human health. And so I wanna show you first some of the direct ways that this impacts human health. Um, and I think the one that we kind of think about if we think at all about water quality and human health is things like diarrheal diseases. So for a very long time, people have been concerned about diarrheal diseases, particularly in children under five. Um, we know that globally, diarrheal disease is one of the main drivers of morbidity and mortality, um, both in, for morbidity, both in low and middle income countries, as well as high income countries. Um, but when we're looking at low and middle income countries, it, diarrheal disease is particularly detrimental to children and particularly harmful. So it's estimated that there are about 1.7 billion cases in children under the age of five annually, which contribute to about 50, 000, or 500,000 deaths. Um, so these graphs are from a study that was documenting the impact of unclean water um, on kind of all causes of childhood mortality up in the left. And you see that kind of the lower access you have to um, improved water, the higher levels of child mortality you have, um, or we can do that vice versa, which would probably be easier. So the less access you have, the higher the child mortality, the higher the diarrheal prevalence, and then the higher rates of stunting that we see. So unclean water and diarrheal disease are thought to account for about 16% of the stunting that we see in children under five in low and middle income countries. And just, I know this is mostly a nutrition crowd, but just in case, um, what we're looking at when we're looking at stunting is we're looking at deficits in height for age as a result of chronic undernutrition um, or chronic illness or the synergy between chronic undernutrition and chronic illness. What's interesting about these findings as well is that there's a graph that's a little bit more unexpected, which is um, the relationship isn't as strong, but there's also an association between childhood fever and water quality. And this is likely due you know, both the direct effects of exposure to pathogens um, that make children sick, but also likely um, having unclean water affects your um, likelihood of having flu or likelihood of having COVID. Um, and so we're seeing kind of systems that we wouldn't be thinking about as being directly linked to water still having an impact when water quality is poor. Systems in this case being our respiratory system. And then those are the sort of acute effects of exposure to contaminated water, but there's also um, subclinical effects that we see as well, which cause, cause considerable undernutrition for children. So we know that repeated exposure to bacteria in water, even at low levels, can contribute to undernutrition and growth faltering, even when we don't see clinical cases of diarrhea. And it's suspected that this is due to um, a condition known as environmental enteric dysfunction, or um, it could be environmental enteropathy, depending on who you're talking to. 
Um, but what this condition is, is this picture that you see on the right, that instead of a normal healthy intestine where you have all these villa, which is where the nutrients are being absorbed through, you have this flatter blunted intestinal wall, which is more permeable to bacteria and also isn't as efficient as absorbing nutrients. So this is common in many low and middle income countries um, and is one of the things that we think links water to stunting in children. And it has some un other sort of unexpected consequences. Um, so along with the reduced nutrient absorption, um, we also see that this condition is associated with child development outcomes, um, cognitive outcomes, and actually lowers vaccine effectiveness. Um, so having this condition may mean that some of our public health interventions don't work as well as we expect them to either. And this is just to show you um, how this looks. Um, this is very hard to measure. And we can talk more about that if you are interested in the Q&A. Um, but this was a sort of classic study that was done in Gambia showing that you know, we see this pretty pronounced growth faltering in children um, in the first um, four to six months of life. And we see at the same time increasing gut permeability during that time. Um, there's also individual data showing that the kids who have the worst of the greatest permeability also have the greatest deficits in growth. So in terms of undernutrition, water contamination has a pretty strong and well-supported link to undernutrition. What surprises some people more is the link to overnutrition. And so this is just one way that we see water impacting cardiometabolic disease risk. Um, this is a study that looks at chronic exposures to metal and drinking water. Um, and in this case is looking at chronic exposure to arsenic, which is both naturally occurring in the groundwater in Mexico, as well as the result of um, mining and other industrial operations. And what this study was showing in a cohort of adults is that those who are living um, with higher levels of arsenic, so not, you know, not something that's going to cause death or you know, these kind of moderate elevated levels of arsenic, are more likely to have um, dyslipidemia. They're more likely to have um, dysregulation in glucose. And um, other work has also shown that this is an arsenic isn't the only thing that does this, right? So we think that lead has similar effects. And some really interesting recent work has shown that sodium in drinking water also seems to be linked to hypertension and that high levels of sodium might be coming from seawater intrusion into water sources. So along with all of those nasty things that are in water, um, we also are seeing new emerging water contaminants. So things like pharmaceuticals and pesticides, antimicrobials, flame retardants, detergents, um, microplastics are measurable in water. And these aren't things that are removed by our kind of standard water treatment processes. Um, for example, uh, antibiotics now reach the water um, from a wide range of sources. And so this could be from human waste, from agriculture, from animal husbandry, from aquaculture. Um, and it looks like increasingly those antimicrobial properties are finding their way into drinking water as well. Um, and that's just one example. Another example is endocrine disrupting chemicals, the PFAS, which um, are now seen distributed throughout the freshwater system and have a wide ranging impact on human development, including neural development, fertility, um, child's cognitive development as well. So those are some direct paths linking water security and health. Um, but what we can also see is this, and where we really see a synergy with nutrition and food insecurity are these indirect paths through which water impacts people's diet, impacts their sanitation practices and their livelihoods. So one of the kind of most obvious places where food insecurity and water insecurity are linked is in food production. So we know that water for farming is critical for food production. It's critical for the success of crops, for the kind of survival of livestock, for aquaculture. Um, and we know that about 70% of water use, freshwater use worldwide is for agriculture. Um, however, most of that is through rain fed. And so those are the green kind of circles that you see here. Um, and the rain-fed agriculture, which is the most common agriculture globally, is the one that's the most um, un unpredictable, I guess is the best way to say it. So it's less productive than irrigated 
operations. It's more susceptible to chronic climate shocks. It's more con um, susceptible to weather conditions. And we know that most farmers, particularly most small-scale farmers globally, are really reliant on rainfall. And so if we have increasing um, variability due to extreme weather events or drought or prolonged drought, then this is going to be a significant barrier to achieving food security globally. Um, we can also see that there's a, invert, there's a bi-directional relationship. So our water impacts what we grow and impacts how much if we have enough food. Um, but the types of foods that we're using, and particularly animal source foods, impact how much water we use for farming. And so um, these kind of water and food are really linked here. So along with growing food, um, preparing food is also strongly linked to water. So water is needed at each stage of food preparation, um, starting with sort of washing fruits and vegetables and trying to get contamination off of them. So residual pe pesticides or soil helmets, um, those things that are going to make children susceptible to diarrhea and adults susceptible to diarrhea. Um, all the way to washing cooking utensils um, when they're used or after they're used. Um, so those are the kind of food prep parts, um, but also water is critically important for foods that are staple foods for a lot of populations globally. And so what this picture is showing is cassava. Um, this picture is showing how cassava needs to be soaked in water and needs to be soaked for quite a long time um, to be able to remove the toxins that are in cassava. Um, and cassava is a really important plant, um, both kind of culturally as well as nutritionally. It's drought resistant, it's carbohydrate rich, it's used in a lot of diets throughout South America um, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, and it has to be both soaked and then boiled to remove these toxins. And we know that during periods of drought um, and water scarcity that food insecure households tend to um, consume these before they've soaked enough or before they've boiled enough, and you can start seeing the neurotoxic effects, um, particularly during periods of prolonged, prolonged drought. Um, and that's due to the exposure to the cyanide in the cassava. Um, we also see kind of changes in what people eat. And so um, within, with households with water scarcity and might change the food that they're preparing in their diet. So maybe they don't have enough uh, water to even attempt the cassava. And so then you see people switching from things like boiling and steaming to frying um, or consuming processed foods that don't need as much preparation. Or you might see people eating out more often and consuming foods away from home. And all of those last things I mentioned are risk factors for overweight and obesity. And one of the places that we see that most strongly is in beverage intake. Um, so the, even in high income countries, this was a study that was done using NHANES data in the US, a nationally representative data. And what you see from this is that the perception that water quality is poor, in this case measured by the fact that people say that they avoid drinking water from their tap, um, is associated with a greater intake of sugar-sweetened beverages, associated with a higher calorie um, intake from su sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, and uh, given the kind of data that I showed you earlier in the talk, it's probably not surprising that there are racial and ethnic differences in the perception of water quality. Um, and so that we see that African-American adults, low-income adults, foreign-born adults in the U.S. are the ones who are more likely to avoid tap water and replace that tap water with these bottled beverages. And this is something that we see um, broadly throughout South America as well. Another um, place where we see changes in behavior associated with water insecurity is in diet diversity. And so we see this as people change their diets and change what they eat based on food production um, and, and, food av and water availability. Um, but we also see changes in people's behaviors that might be responsive to the amount of work it takes to get water. And so we know across, this was a study that was done across 19 global sites looking at water insecurity and their varying levels of water insecurity in these sites. But in all of them, women described that their perception that their water situation was challenging affected how they fed their babies and their children. Um, so they could, um, we might see lower rates of breastfeeding in some places, for example, because mothers felt that they had to take more of their time to be able to walk to access water or using more of their energy for water. Um, we also see changes in dietary quality. So this is just an example 
of one place where this work was done, one particular site in India that was showing that um, how much access um, there was to improved water was associated with the diet diversity of children. And so again, we see this as a response to the foods that are available, having fewer of the high quality foods that are available, but also seeing this as a response to challenges to women's time, since women are the ones who tend to be the ones who have to go gather water. Okay, so with that background, I want to kind of show what we've been working on um, for the past almost 10 years now, which is hard to believe, um, looking at how water and food shape health in our site in the Galapagos. Um, so we work on the Galapagos Islands, which are here. They're about 1,000 kilometers off the coast of Ecuador. Um, there are, it's a large archipelago. There are lots of little islands, but Three of them are inhabited, four of them are, but one of them only has 100 people, so we kind of don't count that one usually. Um, so there are three main inhabited islands. We work on San Cristobal, which is the one with the blue circle. Um, this is the provincial capital. And the reason that we work there, at least initially, is that the University of North Carolina, along with our partners, the University of San Francisco, Quito, have a research building and research labs and research infrastructure. And we've spent, um, as a group, uh, 10 years building ties to the local community, ties to the health system that allow us to do this research. And I think that the Galapagos are a particularly interesting case study. It's not a unique one. So everything I'm going to tell you that happens here happens in other places. Um, but I think there are some unique challenges here that make this an important place to study. Um, and so first, like many places in, um, in Latin America and low and middle income countries, <clears throat> there's been significant population growth. Um, the population size has increased by about 300% in the last decade to be able to meet the demands of tourism, which at least prior to the pandemic was about 275,000 annual visitors. Um, as I showed you, these are kind of small islands. They're far away from land. Um, and lots of research has shown that that population growth and tourism has environmental impacts. But less work has really shown that it affects the health and well-being of the human inhabitants as well. Um, this is an ongoing joke. The people live here because uh, whenever any of our me or any of my colleagues say that we work in the Galapagos, they say with people. Um, and yes, there are about 35,000 people that live there. Um, what makes this setting a little bit different than some others is that it's also a national park and a World Heritage Site. And so 97% of the land on the islands is dedicated to the national park. And that limits how much land can be used for food production and agriculture, or I'm sorry, livestock and agriculture. However, because tourism is much more lucrative, um, the islanders aren't even using all of the land that they could use for food production. And as a result, what you see is that um, people and families are really dependent on the food that comes in off barges. And depending what island you're on, this could be a two-week process, a one-month process. And so by the time that food gets to the island, particularly produce, it's no longer fresh. Um, people complain about the quality, and they consider this expensive. Um, so as a result, we tend to see diets that are more reliant on prepared or packaged foods, um, which people see as safer and cheaper. These are also islands that have limited fresh water. So San Cristobal, where we are, is the only inhabited island that has a fresh water um, source for drinking water. Um, however, that water and, and a municipal water treatment plant. So there's fresh water, it's treated, and it's piped into people's homes. However, it only gets piped in for an hour or two every day. They shift the neighborhoods that they're piping to. Um, so households have to store their water in this kind of blue cistern that you see in the, the top left and um, pipe it in for their needs during the day. Um, this water treatment plant opened in 2012, and the water was quite contaminated before the water treatment plant. So the community really sees the water is unsafe, and they tend to rely on drinking water um, that they buy from these big blue jugs instead. So given this background, we were really interested, in, and the reason that we started this project, I was doing something totally different on C-sections and infant microbiome um, and why moms were using the hospital to give birth or not, um, but that was a home-based study. And whenever we went into people's homes and said, what do you think are the biggest health problems on this island? The answers were uniformly the water quality and the food quality. And so this was really a project that we started because it's what the residents were most interested in. 
And we wanted to document sort of what those impacts looked like for their water and uh, of water and food for their health. Um, so what we see both in the Galapagos and in low and middle income countries more generally is that we see that there's this shift from traditional diets to which tended to be more fresh fruits and vegetables to more high fat, energy dense, or ener high, let's try that again, high fat, energy dense, but nutrient not dense foods. Um, and this has a lot to do with tourism in this case. So the we see the problems with shipping the food in. Fresh food preferentially goes to the tourists in the hotels and restaurants that tourists visit. Um, and this is what you would see sort of in the market that um, residents shop in. Um, and also the indirect effect of tourism. So fewer people are growing food because they can make more money working in the hotels or in the restaurants. And this is a place where we might consider it low income based on our experiences, since it's a middle income country, but it's people on the islands do have more money than you would generally see for people in Ecuador. Um, and so you have people who have the money to be able to purchase these foods and have changed their diets. Um, and that's happened before there have been any infrastructure changes to their water. So basically what I'm saying is we're seeing unhealthy, high fat processed food diets at the same time that we see contaminated water. And those two things together contribute to the dual burden of health uh, and dual burden of unhealth. Um, so we see simultaneous undernutrition, um, particularly uh, iron deficiency, zinc deficiency, um, and stunting alongside overweight and obesity that's among some of the highest in Ecuador. Um, about 70% of adults are overweight or obese, and that's actually some among the highest in the world. Um, and we see this dual burden occurring at multiple levels. So we see it within individuals. We see it within households where you may have a mom who's stunted with a child who's overweight or obese, and we certainly see it in different segments of the population. Um, and we see this globally. This is a global phenomenon, but we also see it in Galapagos. And so um, as a result of those household visits I was telling you about, we um, developed this project. It's called the Healthy Families Project. Um, we trained local researchers along with our study manager, um, who's from Quito, uh, to uh, do the, our surveys, take the blood samples, take the water quality samples, measure anthropometrics. Um, and this was a collaborative project between UNC and USFQ. And what we were interested in doing was looking at how this simultaneous exposure to the, those components of water security and food security were associated with the development of the dual burden in households and in individuals. Um, but what we added to this that we thought was unique was looking at the impacts of psychological distress. So does worrying that you don't have enough water contribute to anxiety and stress in moms, which might contribute to poorer health in themselves or in their children? And we measured this in a lot of different ways. I'm happy to talk about that if anyone has questions. Um, but I just kind of want to give you a sense of what the situation looks like with water. We used a globally validated um, scale to look at water insecurity. And according to that scale, only five of our households had what we would consider moderate or severe water insecurity. Um, and when we asked people whether they had concerns about how much water they had, um, they said only about 15% said they had kind of problems with their water. Uh, the majority of households also rated their water as fine to good. Um, but at the same time, we had about 50% of our households relying on bottled water um, for their drinking water and just under 50% applying additional treatment in their homes to their water. So they're saying the water is good. Their behavior may indicate that they don't think the water is as good um, as they're saying. And we see that in our qualitative interviews. Um, so some of the things that community members told us during the study was, you know, the water isn't drinkable. I think that one of the biggest problems here on the islands are illnesses related to poor water quality. Although we know we have potable water, that the water is clean when it leaves the treatment plant, nonetheless, there are still problems with the pipes. And another family said, in our family, we pay $40 a month for bottled water, which is a large part of my salary. And even though we didn't have a lot of severe water insecurity, we had a sizable minority of the samples, so 20%, 25%, 30%, agreeing with things like um, they felt their water, they were upset about their water situation. They used water that they thought was dirty or smelled or didn't taste good, um, and that they didn't have enough money to pay for water. 
Um, here's the punchline that I forgot to show in class this morning for those of you who are there, which is um, when we actually tested the water. So um, this is what the household water situation looks like. So this is an outdoor kitchen where there's some dishwashing going on. These are barrels used to collect water for cleaning the household. Um, we measured those, the, the tap water coming in that's used for those purposes, and we also measured the water that's in those blue bottles. Um, and what this is showing you is that both for total coliforms and for E. coli, that the drinking water, so those bottled water that they were purchasing or water that they were treating to um, improve the quality actually had more coliforms in it or slightly more E. coli in it. Um, so people were spending money on water that was dirtier than the water that was coming into their house. Um, however, it's still sporadic, which houses have contaminated water and which ones don't coming in from the pipes. So there are real concerns. Um, and we know that this is associated with a number of health outcomes. I'm showing you this one because this is the, the focus of a grant that we're um, have under review that we haven't heard about yet, knock on wood. Um, it's from the National Science Foundation, and the longer you have to wait, the better the outcome usually. Um, <laughs> so we're hoping. Um, but what we're showing here is that um, there's a link between E. coli contamination and household water and GI infections, which shouldn't surprise anyone, but also urinary tract infections, and that we have quite a high prevalence of urinary tract infections in both moms and kids, and these are linked to households that have poorer water quality. So it looks like, at least in this context, that UTIs might be a waterborne condition. Um, and as I kind of started this talk saying, water security doesn't occur alone. We know that water insecurity and food insecurity go together to have health impacts, and that's the case in this setting as well. Um, so we have about 40% of households who suffer from food insecurity, um, at least mild or moderate food insecurity. And what's unique about food insecurity in this situation is not that there is food insecurity, but the fact that it's episodic. And so, as some of our participants have said, well, it's not that we don't have enough money for food, it's just that there isn't any food available. And so, if the boat's not there, there's no food, there's no variety. And so, people's behavior is really shaped by that concern that you don't know when food is going to run out. Um, and we know that those, those two conditions tend to overlap. So we only had about 17% of our sample who, and these are households in our sample, that didn't suffer from either water or food insecurity, and over a third suffered from both. Um, water insecurity was more common, either on its own or um, with food in combination. And when we looked at the relationship between these conditions and the dual burden of disease within households, we found that um, first, it's kind of shocking that about 80% of households total suffered from the dual burden. So they had one person suffering from undernutrition and one person suffering from overnutrition, which in a place where you have a limited healthcare system is a challenge um, for families and for the healthcare system. Um, but we also found that that was higher and highest, in fact, in the households where there was water and food insecurity compared to those households that had neither concern. So we see these effects on physical health of water um, and, the part, and the effect of water and food together. And where we see it even more strongly is when we look at mental health. Um, so we measured anxiety and depression and stress, and we combine those here in a measure called distress, so having at least one of those conditions. And we saw this almost dose-response relationship that those who suffered from both water and food insecurity had the greatest risk of um, suffering from distress. Uh, there are lots of reasons why that's the case. I won't go into all the, <laughs> the equations under this unless you're interested. Um, but what we were trying to show here is that when we look at those components of water and food insecurity, so the access, the, the perceived security, and the quality, um, at the same time, we see both direct paths between water and food and our undernutrition and overnutrition. But we also see this important path, at least for our, our undernutrition, through distress. And so that water and food were con or constraints in water and food were contributing to distress, and that was enhancing um, the effect of water and food on undernutrition. So what lessons did we learn from this setting? Um, we know that it's somewhat different and that it's geographically isolated and it's dependent on tourism, which makes residents vulnerable to food insecurity and poor water quality and limited health care, and that contributes to their risk of disease. Um, 
We also know that this vulnerability is exacerbated by population growth and increasing tourism. And those two processes um, also contribute and, and widen the social determinants of health that we see. The people that are able to capitalize on tourism are the people who are more educated, who speak English, who have a higher income so that they can host students in their homes, for example. Um, and so this really is disadvantaging indigenous, non-English speaking and rural residents of the islands. Um, as islands, they're particularly vulnerable to climate related changes. So including rainfall, rising sea levels, um, extreme weather events, and, and economic disasters and economic shocks for things like pandemics. So the islands lost about 80% of their income during the pandemic when tourism was, was shut down. However, um, despite these sort of lessons and the uniqueness of the situation, I think they link to what we see as global water pattern global water challenges more broadly. So the patterns that we're seeing on Galapagos are not unique. Um, and you know, there are several examples, including an ongoing drought right now in the Horn of Africa, um, the drought that I showed you, the well from in India, that really um, are showing us at least a, a kind of view of what the future might look like. So we know that fresh water availability is decreasing. We know that there's this increasing risk of what's been called a slow onset disaster due to water scarcity, to droughts, um, to famines that are linked to climate change and linked to mismanagement of water. And we know that that's going to have significant significant health impacts through undernutrition and reduced food production. We also know that water scarcity is one of the primary causes of migration, or is a primary cause, or is a cause of migration, I should say, um, and that that process is often associated with conflict and violence. Um, and we're seeing, um, I don't know if you've seen our news, but we have people that are taking shots at our um, electrical grid, um, literally taking gunshots at our electrical grid to bring them down in parts of the US. Um, and there's place, other places where we've seen that happen with water and sanitation infrastructure as well. Um, we know that water insecurity and water scarcity enhance existing tensions. Um, they weaken health systems. They contribute to increased risk of health problems. They burden economies and they create inequality. Um, and we know that this vulnerability is enhanced for people who are indigenous, people who are um, racialized, people who are living in poverty. So despite the multiple links that we see between water and human health, uh, or because of these multiple links that we see between water and human health, both the direct and indirect, um, it's really important that we think about developing strategies now to um, mitigate what we know are gonna be even stronger risks in the future um, for individuals, physical, mental, and community health in the face of climate change. And so with that, I would like to say thank you to all of you. Um, and then thank you to the many um, people and collaborators that have been part of this project. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions. I'm gonna bring the microphone to you. just wanted to thank you again um, for everyone being here as well. This is a, a, a bit of an, uh, an exciting adventure to try and um, have some uh, collaboration. So I really appreciate everything that you've, you've given us as far as information. Um, <clears throat> I'm a donor for a foster child in Quito, Ecuador. Ecuador. Mm -hmm. So oh, wow. I, not daily do I just have conversations with them. I, um, obviously my Spanish isn't that great, but um, I, I think what I wanted to ask you was, um, how do you um, how do you accept sort of an ethical approach when you're trying to a access information from uh, a lot of the indigenous peoples that live on these islands? Mm -hmm. So so that's my first question. <laughs> my next question is, um, we do think of water as being very human centric, and I'm wondering if um, you could maybe even speak to the fact that there are aquatic um, invertebrates that really do rely on, on healthy streams and, and water systems. And just to, um, just to find out if that's, an, it's a, if that's something that has occurred as well in your, in your studies. I have a, um, a very good friend who's, who would have loved to have been here today, Carl Hunt, he's a retired biologist. And um, he's, he's really hoping that we show the protection of our waters 
Um, he came up with a really good acronym, SOS, Save Our Streams, um, and H2O, Headwaters to Oceans. Thank you. Thank you for both of those questions. So um, the first question about, I should have, every time I give a talk, I realize that I really need to define what I mean by indigenous in this case. So um, I should say that the islands don't have a sort of indigenous population from the islands. And so when I mention indigenous, I mean Ecuadorian migrants from, from the highlands, mostly from the highlands, not as many from the Amazon move to, to Galapagos. Um, that's not to say they're not marginalized in Galapagos and that some of the jobs that they're doing in Galapagos are the kind of rural farm work jobs that put them at, at risk for discrimination and lower pay. Um, so they certainly suffer the con concerns of being indigenous. They're not just not indigenous to the islands. Um, I think that the reason that we're able to do research in the community um, is because we've built this long relationship with the community in a number of different ways. Um, so our health projects are always done in collaboration with the Ministry of Health. Um, and in the rural areas where a lot of the indigenous um, families live through the community health center that's there. Um, so we've been able to sort of build up rapport. Um, this project is one that the community really highlighted as being of something that was of concern to them. But certainly we want to make sure that we're giving back information so water quality testing isn't available to people. Um, and people are very concerned about the quality of their water. So we always return results to households um, and tell them sort of, you know, if we think they should boil water, for example. Um, we've written reports for the municipality. We were invited to Isabella Island, which is a little bit more distant, smaller population, but they had heard about our work on San Cristobal and they wanted to prove that their water system was inequitable. And so, you know, those are the types of things that we're trying to do to be able to make sure that we're doing research ethically. Um, and. Uh, we're in the process of trying to refund our center at UNC and we've met with various deans and we met with the dean of the School of Global Health and she said, you know, how do we go about getting you out of there, uh, you know, decolonizing the global health process? And we said, well, they actually don't already need us. Like our, our collaborators in, in Quito could do this project without us. It's just that, um, you know, they think we add something and the community thinks we add something. So that's really our goal is the fact that we want to add something, not, not direct it. Um, and then as far as your second question goes, as an anthropologist, of course, I am human centric. So that is a, <laughs> that is a, you know, that's a fair critique. But also, um, even if I just want to take your question from a human perspective, we need healthy rivers and we need healthy oceans because we need productivity of fish and other invertebrates that are going to be food sources for humans, we hope, sustainable food sources for humans in the future. Um, we tried to do a little bit of um, disaggregating our data to see um, about fish intake and what fish intake look like. We haven't quite gotten that far yet, um, but that's certainly something that we're interested in. Thank you very much uh, for a very uh, informative uh, information. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, can you give any ideas about uh, the role of uh, water wastage uh, on the effect of uh, on uh, water shortage? Sure, I mean, we, um, we see that both at the kind of individual level as well as larger community and system levels. I'm gonna speak about it at the household level because that's what I'm personally most familiar with, but we know that water wastage is a huge problem globally as well. Um, what's interesting about this work in Galapagos and other work in places that we do is because of the storage issue and because of people's concerns that they won't have enough water, there's actually times when there's excess water. And so people are getting more water shipped to them than they need, and they just sort of let it overflow. Um, that also happens during periods. So Galapagos are, and, and much of Ecuador is on the equator, so it's pretty seasonal, except for the fact that there is one season where it's just kind of a, a wet mist, and then there's a season that's hotter that has monsoon rains. And so during that monsoon rain period, people tend to collect rainwater for household use as well. Um, but there isn't, 
and then there's also sort of excess capture during that time. So we do see that people aren't kind of utilizing all the water that they have available to them at certain points of the year as well. Um, so this is just one example, um, but I know that this is something that people are concerned about globally. And then also I said, you know, agricultural production is one of the main water uses, but so is industry. Um, and there's been concerns about sort of misuse of water resources by industry as well, contributing to waste of water. Yeah, in this case, even at the household, it's it, people could overuse, certainly, but people also waste. So if they don't use it all, they just kind of flush it down the street, for example. Thank you for a great talk. I was just curious, during the pandemic, was the accessibility to the water and food from the barge still the same or did that change the behavior in the communities to start farming or use their municipal water yeah great question um we we did we tried to do a couple of small-scale zoom based studies because the other thing that happens when you don't have two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars Two hundred and seventy-five thousand tours is that you actually have some internet bandwidth to be able to <laughs> see your colleagues on Zoom, um, which we don't normally have. And so we also did some interviews with households and key stakeholders. Um, and there were some really severe limitations when the pandemic started. There was really a push to isolate the islands, and so the barges didn't come. Fishermen couldn't use the marine reserve. They weren't allowed to take boats out of the port, um, and people had sort of timed when they could leave their house to go to the markets and food was coming in by airplane as humanitarian drops. Um, so we're really talking about an extreme situation, at least initially. Um, and so you did see changes in people's diets and you saw changes um, in people's food production. And so one of the interesting things is that for a while, people's diets actually got considerably healthier um, because the restaurants were closed and people would go and if they went to the store and they saw that spinach was there, they would buy all the spinach and then they would share that with their friends and family. Um, so we saw sort of more food sharing, we saw shifts in what people were eating. Um, people who had been working in tourism, who had family plots up in the highlands, would go up into the highlands um, to grow fruits and vegetables to be able to diversify their diets. Um, fewer people, I have a graduate student who did sort of some qualitative research about the water. Um, people didn't seem to think that the water situation improved. So they really saw changes in their diet that occurred, but they didn't think their water had gotten any better or that they had more water available than they did before. They still kind of maintain the same water concerns. Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm glad you were able to come and join us. Uh, early on in your presentation, you showed uh, water use from rainfall and surface water uh, versus water use from groundwater extraction for uh, mainly food production and usage. Where there's the huge groundwater extraction is the food bowl of North America. That's where most of the food is produced, uh, the crops, soybeans, corn, cattle, livestock, pigs, chickens, that, and they're coming out of groundwater. Is any, yes, so um, that's a concern is where, what are we gonna do? Because that ground, my understanding is those aquifers are being withdrawn much, much faster than they are being recharged. Right. Yeah, this is a, if I had the solution to that problem, that would be <laughs> fantastic. But yes, I mean, that's obviously a really large concern. Um, the paper, I just un embarrassingly noticed I didn't cite this paper, but what this paper was talking about is that this could actually increase global inequities. So we see inequities here in sort of who has access to irrigation versus, or you know, groundwater versus the rainwater. Um, and this paper was arguing that as we project this into the future, we are gonna see kind of water importation from these places that aren't running into the same problems with too much groundwater extraction and so that there's going to be this water economy that could occur um, as well as sort of exacerbating who are the importers versus who are the exporters or at least changing who are the importers versus who are the exporters for food products as well. Well we in Canada are quite worried about that because uh, we have lots of water and the United States is running out of water. Right. Um, 
we were <laughs> before before the lecture started. We were hearing about um, a historic plan to take water from Canada and, and bring it all the way down to Phoenix and LA. Um, I, I, I kind of doubt our, our political situation is going to make that possible anytime soon, nor should it. But but you know there are also a number of places in Canada, particularly the urban areas along the border, that also have quite are at quite high risk of running out of groundwater. So it looks like most of the availability of the aquifers is sort of further north um, as well. Well, I'm glad I 100% recycle all my water. <laughs> I'll come to you. I think we have time for maybe one more, maybe two. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. And uh, you want a controversial question. <laughs> so controversial question to an anthropologist. Are you aware of any research done uh, when native population disease prevalence versus national average uh, prevalence have taken uh, inbreeding index into consideration? Have taken what index? I'm sorry. Because <clears throat> what I want to say that I don't think that um, the prevalence between indigenous communities, especially up north in Canada, versus uh, national average is methodologically correct mm. to compare because average population in the US and in Canada is highly heterogeneous mm -hmm. due to immigration and everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, all northern communities and native communities, they're all relatives. They're all blood relatives. So. What they have there, they have selective enrichment of certain genes, of certain immunological traits. Have anyone taken a look at it from this point of view? So what I want to say that, yes, you look for genes, but not in pathogens, but in, in humans, because infectious process mm -hmm. has two ends. Thank you. So no is the quick answer to your question. I don't think I've seen that type of research. And I'm going to answer for the US because I'm going to, you know, bumble an answer that will probably be incorrect for Canada, and you can all tell me that. Um, but if I think about US indigenous populations, we've done a lot of genetic testing in places like um, the Southwest with the Pima, for example, um, and looking at you know, could we find the gene that was making them thrifty and contributing to obesity and diabetes? And we didn't really see any genes that look different among the Pima versus other, you know, non-indigenous populations in the area that could account for prevalence differences. I haven't seen that with water and diarrheal disease. Um, and I'm not sure I can think of what Right now, I can't think of the mechanism that I, I think could be genetically impacted, but I know that you know there have been billions and billions of dollars spent on doing genetic testing and um, in relation to obesity and diabetes and in native populations in the U.S. And we haven't found enough genetic differences to explain prevalence differences. So maybe there are underlying genetic differences. I'm not sure of that literature, um, but I'm not. I, I don't think it would erase the the really dramatic differences that we see. Um, between native or indigenous and non-indigenous populations. I mean, 26 times um, the case count of, of diarrheal disease is pretty significant, and that would be a very, very large genetic effect for us to find. Whatever else is uh, <laughs> relevant, because um, there was a very elegant publication done by the US uh, researchers on um, Spanish flu, mm -hmm. when they uh, isolated and sequenced uh, the Spanish mm -hmm. flu virus, and they didn't find any major horrible differences between that strain and modern strain that circulate nowadays. But what they have found uh, was the mutation in one of the, I don't remember exactly, I'm not an immunologist, uh, the genes that made the people who died of that Spanish flu overreact mm -hmm. and perceive that the pathogen is a super, uh, super antigen. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's what they meant. Yeah. Okay, so let me, um, here is my real controversial statement on today then. My real controversial statement on today is I'm sure there are genetic differences. I'm sure there are genetic differences that are important for immune function, um, but I don't think we have to go that far to find an answer. I think that if we look at structural conditions, uh, structural factors, if we look at socioeconomic conditions, I think we can explain quite a lot of the differences we see even before we go to the biology. That's my controversial statement for today. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have one more question. Is that okay, or do you want to move forward? Okay. Do I have to say something more controversial than that? No, I have to think no, about it. Okay. Controversial. I was wondering when you tested the water for the mm -hmm. piped in and the bottled, and mm -hmm. found that uh, contamination or whatever was consistent between the two or similar. If you told the people that, did they alter their water usage or are they still believe that the bottled water was better? Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of alterations and I have to say, you know, people do really irrational things when they think about water and their health and I have done this study, I conducted this study, I still use the bottled water to brush my teeth rather than the tap water um, in the places that I stay when I go there as well. So I think changing cultural norms around water use are, are really challenging and, and maybe don't, um, don't necessarily uh, change as quickly as you would think based on the data. Okay, so please join me in thanking our speaker. Um, I also want to just remind you that this presentation will go up on, I think it'll be our faculty website. Is that right, Christine? Yeah, our faculty website. So please share it with anyone who might like to see it or if you'd like to watch it again. And I'd like to end with um, really a special thanks to our good friend, Dr. Ron Ball, for making this possible. Um, we enjoyed a really nice dinner with Ron and Ruth last night, which was great. And um, this, is, this is really a nice, a nice thing that you've done to fund this. So thank you very much. OK, so help yourself to any more food you would like at the back. Um. <laughs> and if I could just put in one plug, we have the MP lecture that's also coming up. Focus on Inuit culture. It's going to be at the Tullus World of Science. Uh, have a look again at our website for the, the empty lecture. Uh, I think it will also be uh, uh, a rather remarkable opportunity to learn a great uh, many new things. And thank you, of course, Dr. Thompson, for a great presentation.